13. Andrew Miasor 21-year-old security driver named Andrew Miasor thought he'd successfully pulled off a fake heist in East London in December 2021 when he worked with an accomplice to steal nearly £1 million in cash during his work shift. The crime was masterminded by 40-year-old Stefanos Cantares, who led a gang of thieves who were captured on camera loading bags full of money into a getaway vehicle. Meanwhile, Miasor handcuffed himself to the steering wheel of his work van. He then waited two hours before dialing for emergency help by touching his nose to his phone. Miasor told investigators that Cantares approached him in a latex mask while he was leaving his home and ordered him around at gunpoint. Doorbell camera footage captured the interaction, which the co-conspirators were accused of filming on purpose as a way to prove the so-called robbery actually happened. The heist was initially labeled as a tiger kidnapping, which is when the captors forced their hostage to commit a crime to avoid being harmed. But it was no longer considered as such once law enforcement realized that Miasor was in on the crime. After the robbery, Miasor claimed that he was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. He went on medical leave from his job while collecting disability pay, and he allegedly bragged to a friend about how he was faking his illness and milking his employer. The money received from the phony ambush was never recovered. Miasor and Cantares were both charged in connection with the bogus robbery. In court, Miasor's attorney depicted his client as gullible, overly trusting, and almost childlike. He also pointed out that Miasor hadn't received any of the £100,000 that his accomplices had promised him for his role in the heist. In the meantime, Cantaris allegedly blew the money on lavish vacations, expensive jewelry, and other frivolous expenditures. The court found Miasor guilty of conspiracy to commit theft and conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. Cantaris pleaded guilty to theft and was convicted of conspiracy to pervert the course of justice, but both men were acquitted of conspiracy to launder money. Cantaris was sentenced to four years and five months in prison, while Miasor received a four-year and ten-month sentence. 12. Chantel Stigny In early 2019, police responded to a call about a possible robbery at a Dr. John's adult novelty store in Lincoln, Nebraska. The employee on duty, Chantel Stigny, claimed that a masked man had entered the business brandishing a gun and had stolen thousands of dollars worth of merchandise. She also accused the armed robber of stealing the store's surveillance system, as well as money out of the cash till. By the time the police arrived, the suspected thief was long gone, but there were inconsistencies in Stigny's story about what happened. The getaway vehicle used in the crime allegedly belonged to someone she knew. Law enforcement also accused Stigny of entering the store's back room and disconnecting the security system during the alleged robbery. Investigators managed to recover the footage from before the system was unplugged. According to police, it appeared to show a vehicle pulling up to the store and blinking the headlights twice, as if to signal Stigny that it was time to disconnect the camera. Nearly two months after the robbery, Stigny was charged with aiding and abetting. Authorities said that some of the stolen property had been recovered and that they expected to make more arrests in the coming days. But for now, the outcome of the case is unclear. 11. Nisha harris Brazel. In early 2022, best friends Nisha harris Brazel and Maria Edwards thought it would be a great idea to stage a robbery at the Burger King restaurant where they worked. The girls hatched the plot with Maria's dad, 41-year-old Antoine Edwards, who agreed to demand money from the till at gunpoint. They apparently didn't think about the fact that someone else in the restaurant might also have a gun and that the person might use it, but that's exactly what happened, and the situation backfired in the worst way imaginable. Just as the group had planned, Antoine Edwards entered the restaurant with a pistol in his hand and demanded money from the register. Harris Brazel played along and acted terrified as she screamed for help and took the cash out of the till. But unaware that the robbery was staged and that Edwards didn't plan to shoot anyone, one of the girl's co-workers, 34-year-old Derek Ellis, pulled out his own gun and fired at Edwards. And amid the chaos, a bullet fatally struck Harris Brazel. At first, police thought Edwards had shot the teen. 
but a review of the surveillance footage showed that the bullet had actually come from Ellis's gun, and that Edwards hadn't opened fire at any point during the interaction. However, because Edwards had played an active role in staging the robbery, authorities held him accountable for Harris Brazell's death. He was charged with felony murder, intentionally contributing to the delinquency of a minor and being a felon in possession of a firearm. Meanwhile, Derek Ellis insisted that he was only trying to defend Harris Brazell and that he was aiming for Edwards because he truly thought the teen and others inside the restaurant were in danger. He also apologized to Harris Brazell's family and expressed deep remorse for his actions. But as a convicted felon, he wasn't supposed to have a gun at all. He pleaded guilty to illegally possessing a firearm and was sentenced to a year in prison followed by four years of probation. Antoine Edwards pleaded guilty to felony murder. At a sentencing hearing, his lawyer urged the judge to consider the fact that Edwards was essentially at rock bottom at the time of the staged robbery. According to the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, Edwards had just gone through a breakup and was living out of his car. He also had an addiction to drugs and alcohol. Edwards further explained that he came up with the idea after overhearing his daughter talking about how much money was kept inside the register at the Burger King restaurant. He said he wasn't thinking clearly and that he didn't expect the situation to have a deadly outcome. Even the district attorney acknowledged that Edwards had taken responsibility for his actions and urged the judge to sentence him to 20 years rather than the 30-year maximum that he faced. And in the end, the judge imposed a 23-year prison sentence followed by five years of probation, citing Edwards' decision to involve the teen girls in his plot as a very aggravating factor. 10. Carnegie Library Heist over a nearly 20-year period starting in the late 1990s, the head archivist at the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh conspired with a rare bookshop owner to steal over 300 books, maps, illustrations, and images with an estimated total value of at least $8 million. The archivist, Gregory Pryor, and the bookstore owner, John Schulman, were accused of cannibalizing the library's rare collection after they were finally caught and arrested in July 2018. The items were kept in the William R. Oliver Special Collections Room, where Pryor had acted as the sole overseer since 1992. Visitors were required to put their belongings inside lockers near Pryor's desk at the front of the room. And assuming Pryor was diligent about watching visitors as they came and went, it would have been hard for anyone other than him to steal anything from the collections room. Most of the items that were removed are irreplaceable, and included among the stolen pieces was Isaac Newton's Philosophia Naturalis Principia Mathematica, which is worth an estimated $900,000 alone. It's considered to be one of the most influential science books of all time. A rare copy of the Journal of General George Washington, a first edition book from 1787 bearing Thomas Jefferson's signature, and a copy of Adam Smith's An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations also disappeared from the library's collection. According to authorities, Pryor dropped the stolen items off at Shulman's store on his way home from work. Shulman then proceeded to sell the materials on eBay and other online platforms. The amount of money Shulman made is unclear, while records show that Pryor received at least $117,000 from Shulman's bookstore between 2010 and 2017. During that same period, Pryor also made cash deposits totaling at least $17,000. Pryor's superiors became suspicious of him after an audit turned up discrepancies in 2017. An anonymous tip soon followed, and he was suspended and eventually fired from his job while an investigation was carried out. In the meantime, the room was locked up and was kept off-limits to visitors. According to an affidavit, Pryor admitted to his crimes during questioning. He allegedly told investigators that greed had overtaken him and said he used the money to pay living expenses and tuition for his kids. Pryor also said that he stopped peddling the stolen wares in 2016 after he found out that the collection was going to be audited. Meanwhile, Schulman reportedly denied marking the stolen items with a stamp to make it look like they'd been legitimately removed from the library. But the evidence showed otherwise, and the stamp he used was found during a raid of the bookstore's warehouse. 
Authorities eventually recovered roughly $1 million worth of materials, including Newton's Principia. But the vast majority of the stolen items, such as Washington's journal, remain missing to this day. In mid-2020, Shulman pleaded guilty to forgery, receiving stolen property and theft by deception. He was sentenced to four years of house arrest, followed by 12 years of probation, and was ordered to pay $55,000 in restitution. The judge who imposed the punishment made it clear that if it weren't for the COVID-19 pandemic, he would have sentenced Shulman to prison time. And because the defendant was a first-time offender and his crimes were non-violent, it was deemed in the best interests of public safety for him to not spend any time behind bars. Pryor pleaded guilty to receiving stolen property and theft by unlawful taking and was sentenced to three years of house arrest followed by 12 years of probation. It was made clear that he would also have faced a heavier punishment if it weren't for the coronavirus pandemic. 9. Robert Hansen Robert Hansen became a double agent in 1979, just three years after joining the FBI, when he approached Soviet officials and offered to share highly classified national security information in exchange for payment. Over a more than 20-year period, he committed espionage on and off in exchange for cash, diamonds, and other valuables, amounting to a total value of $1.4 million. Operating under the alias Ramon Garcia, Hansen shared valuable information that was gleaned from his job as a Soviet counterintelligence agent. He was caught committing serious security breaches against the government on at least one occasion, but no disciplinary action was ever taken. His activities went largely unnoticed until sometime during the 1990s. That's when federal investigators realized that classified information was still being shared by someone within the intelligence community after the arrest of Aldrich Ames, a crooked CIA agent had also been spying for Russia. In 2000, after mistakenly focusing their efforts on the wrong suspect for several years, investigators finally obtained solid documentation implicating Hansen as a mole. In an effort to catch Hansen red-handed before his upcoming planned retirement, detectives bugged his office with surveillance cameras and microphones. And at the peak of the investigation in early 2001, as many as 300 agents were working on the case involving Hansen. By tracking his every movement and keeping a constant eye and ear on his activities, they finally secured proof that he'd betrayed the US on one of the deepest imaginable levels. Just months after his arrest, Hansen pleaded guilty to 15 counts of espionage. He was then sentenced to life in prison without parole, and his betrayal is remembered to this day as one of the biggest intelligence disasters in US history. According to American officials, Hansen was at least partially responsible for the deaths of three spies who shared valuable information with US intelligence agencies, including a Soviet army general nicknamed Top Hat, who was executed in 1986. Hansen passed away behind bars in June of 2023 at the ADX Florence Federal Prison in Colorado, where he was found unresponsive in his cell. He was 79 years old at the time. A Bureau of Prison spokesperson said that life-saving measures were taken, but emergency responders were unable to revive the elderly prisoner. 8. Tracy Delgado Early one morning in June 2023, two masked individuals entered a Santander bank branch in Providence, Rhode Island, and stole nearly a half million dollars in cash. One of the suspects was seen on surveillance footage entering an employee access code while the other wheeled in a suitcase. Once inside, the same person who entered the access code on the front door used another code to access the bank's vault, where the pair filled the suitcase with $488,000. Investigators identified the bank's former branch manager, 30-year-old Tracy Delgado, and a 37-year-old woman named Justine Fernandez as the suspects who entered the bank. Tracy's boyfriend, 42-year-old Stanley Palmer, allegedly drove the getaway car that the woman fled the scene in. Justine Fernandez was arrested in the month following the heist. She has a lengthy criminal record dating at least as far back as 2014 and was charged with drug possession shortly before the bank heist. 
According to court documents obtained by local station WPRI, authorities became suspicious of Justine's possible involvement in the bank robbery after noticing that she'd come into a large amount of money. A tipster claimed that she'd recently retrieved a big chunk of cash from a storage unit in North Providence and had used it to buy a new car. Officers took Fernandez into custody on an outstanding warrant in connection with an unrelated case and used the opportunity to question her about the heist. She reportedly admitted to helping Delgado steal the money and implicated Palmer as the getaway driver. Law enforcement recovered over $24,000 of the stolen money during a raid on the storage unit. They also found a ski mask, two cell phones, a laptop, documents, and other evidence. But by then, Delgado and Palmer had fled Rhode Island. Luckily, though, they were captured at a hotel in Port Tucket two months later shortly after arriving back in the state. The couple posted bond and were freed just hours later while awaiting their next court date. There have been no recent updates on the case, which appears to be ongoing. The suspects each face charges of larceny, conspiracy, and breaking and entering, so we'll have to wait and see what punishment they receive in the coming months. 7. Black Market Bourbon Over the last decade or so, bourbon has become increasingly popular throughout the United States, causing the demand for rare bottles of the liquor to spike considerably. Those who can afford it are often willing to travel long distances and drop thousands of dollars to get their hands on highly coveted bourbons. In Virginia, all liquors sold through government-owned and controlled stores, where bottles go for significantly cheaper prices than in most other states. As a result, whiskey fanatics often scramble to the state in search of rare bottles of bourbon. But it's somewhat of a guessing game, since the arrival of certain whiskies is announced at random and without warning. Once the announcement is made, though, people scramble to the stores, where access to the bottles is first come, first serve. To help bourbon enthusiasts beat the crowds, two suspects allegedly sold insider information on which stores would receive the first shipments of the most in-demand bottles. According to investigators, 28-year-old Edgar Smith Garcia and 45-year-old Robert William Adams worked together to carry out the scheme. Garcia, a former Liquor Authority employee, was accused of providing the shipment details, while Adams allegedly offered the information to members of bourbon hunting groups on social media for a fee. The men were arrested in 2022 after commenters tipped off the authorities on social media posts. Both defendants entered plea agreements with Hanover County prosecutors in exchange for getting multiple charges dropped. In April 2023, Adams received a one-year suspended prison sentence, which means that he'll avoid any time behind bars as long as he behaves according to certain rules set forth by the court. Garcia took a similar plea deal and received a two-year suspended sentence. After discovering the scheme, the Virginia Alcoholic Beverage Control Authority seized more than 200 bottles of liquor from Adams. The agency also randomized its distribution system to prevent a similar insider job from happening again in the future. 6. Isaiah Jones We've all had days where we really didn't want to work, but some people have gone to crazy lengths to avoid doing their jobs. An Oklahoma man named Isaiah Jones is accused of being one such individual in June of 2023 when he allegedly asked a friend to rob the Quick Trip convenience store where he was working so he could go home early. According to law enforcement, Jones told responding officers that a man had entered the store and handed him a handwritten note demanding all the cash in the register and threatening to shoot him if he refused to comply. But the situation took an unexpected turn when police interviewed the suspect Stephen Jones, who reportedly confessed to the robbery. He told the cops that his friend Alia Locke masterminded the crime after receiving a request from Isaiah to have the store robbed so he could end his shift early. The very next day, police arrested Alia Locke, who also confessed to her role in the crime. She showed investigators the text messages between her and Isaiah and admitted that he'd paid her as a reward for carrying out the robbery. According to a police report, records showed that Locke received a $160 payment. Isaiah also confessed after being arrested several days later, telling the police that he'd wanted to go home because he was tired. 
He was charged with embezzlement and conspiracy to commit a felony, while Stephen Jones was charged with conspiracy to commit embezzlement and being a convict in possession of a weapon. Locke was arrested on a warrant for an unrelated case involving a stolen car and was charged with embezzlement in connection with the bogus convenience store robbery. 5. Jag Texera In April 2023, US Air National Guardsman Jag Texera called up his closest video gaming buddies with an unexpected and sudden goodbye message. The farewell came shortly before FBI agents raided the 21-year-old's home in North Dighton, Massachusetts. As an airman first class assigned to an intelligence unit, Texera had access to classified government information. But on at least two occasions in September and October 2022, he'd been caught conducting suspicious searches and stuffing a handwritten note about a classified matter into his pocket. Texera was given a stern talking to by his superiors, who warned him to stop researching classified information unrelated to his job and taking notes about sensitive topics. But he allegedly continued to mishandle classified information and passed on secrets about the Ukraine conflict to his gamer friends over the Discord app for several months. According to the New York Times, a master sergeant caught Texera inappropriately accessing classified reports yet again in January 2023 at the Air Force Base in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Despite this being at least the third incident of its kind, Texera was allowed to keep his job and his top-level security clearance. And in the meantime, he obtained a certificate for completing a training program to prevent the unauthorized disclosure of classified information. By the time Texera was finally arrested, he'd allegedly uploaded classified documents to a Discord platform with dozens of members who'd previously expressed their suspicions that the American government is a dark force that overextends its reach over civilian life. Texera also reportedly expressed anti-government and anti-military sentiments during the server's discussions and said that he regretted joining the Air Force. He marked the documents he shared with his own notations and supposedly got upset when he felt his fellow group members weren't taking his commentary seriously. The documents were eventually linked to other groups and from there they spread all over the internet. It soon became evident to Texera that a run-in with the law enforcement was inevitable. And it was around this time that he said his goodbyes to his gaming friends and waited on his front porch for the authorities to show up. During the raid on Texera's property, federal agents reportedly found a stockpile of weapons next to the airman's bed, including shotguns, handguns, at least one assault rifle, and a gas mask. Given his training, prosecutors argued that he knowingly broke the law. He was charged under the Espionage Act of 1917 with one count of retaining and transmitting national defense information without authorization, as well as one count of unauthorized removal and retention of classified information. Texera's defense attorney urged the judge to release him on bond, while prosecutors argued that he posed a substantial risk of possessing and continuing to share classified information. For now, he remains held without bond while awaiting trial. After news of the disgraced former airman's arrest broke, many questioned why he wasn't stopped after one of the first several times he was caught. According to a New York Times investigation, Texera was fixated on mass shootings, conspiracy theories, and weapons. He also had a noticeable habit of having to prove he was right and shamelessly enjoyed the perks of his military position while accusing the government of grooming teens and young adults to become mass shooters. Authorities have not yet offered an explanation on why Texera was allowed to remain in his job position after he established a habit of misusing classified information. He even disobeyed repeated warnings to stop conducting deep dive searches, yet he was allowed to keep his job. As they say, hindsight is 2020, and the disturbing details are likely to come out as the case works its way through the court system. 4. Brian Martinez Rodriguez just days before the 2023 New Year, a group of armed thieves stole $1.1 million in cash from an armored truck in Converse, Texas, marking the third major robbery of its kind in the region over a four-month period. According to police, the incident began at around 9 a.m. outside an AutoZone store. 
A security guard had exited the armored trunk and gone inside the store to do routine business while the trunk's driver waited inside the vehicle. At this point, a man approached and forced the driver to drive away at gunpoint. Thief then demanded that the driver stop in a residential area nearby, where three waiting suspects helped remove the money from the trunk and loaded it into a getaway vehicle. Luckily, nobody was shot during the heist. The driver, 23-year-old Brian Martinez Rodriguez, was taken to the hospital with minor injuries. He reportedly told investigators that the gunman who approached him outside AutoZone roughed him up for 20 seconds before forcing him to drive. But surveillance footage appeared to show Martinez Rodriguez signaling to the armed man to approach after his co-worker went inside the store, and the truck reportedly drove away within seven seconds of the gunman approaching. He was also accused of giving his employer a different story than he gave to law enforcement. Detectives' suspicions were further heightened when they learned that Martinez Rodriguez was about to be fired for failing to get his gun carry permit. He'd been given 30 days to challenge the decision, and the robbery occurred on day 29. A search of his cell phone yielded photos of the inside of the truck, which may have been used to familiarize his co-conspirators with the vehicle's interior ahead of the robbery. The photos were taken on the same day Martinez Rodriguez learned of the company's decision to fire him. He was charged with first-degree theft over $300,000, but his case appears to be ongoing. His childhood friend, 23-year-old Maurice Mercado, was also charged with felony theft. While out on bond a few months later, he was arrested on drug charges after a large amount of marijuana and methamphetamine were found on his property during a raid. For now, though, Mercado's case also appears to be ongoing. 3. Costa Rica's Biggest Ever Bank Heist In October 2023, Costa Rican authorities announced that the largest ever bank heist in the country's history had taken place and that it was an inside job. According to police, an employee of a Banco Nacional branch removed 3.3 billion colones or 6.1 million US dollars from the vault, while other employees worked to cover up the theft. At least eight bank officials were arrested over the course of 11 police raids, which came two months after the robbery occurred. Included among the accused is Olivas Valle, who was captured on surveillance footage as he stuffed envelopes full of cash from the vault. While he and several co-workers allegedly carried out this task, other staff members watched on monitors to ensure that they weren't caught. Authorities are now accusing bank officials of neglecting to thoroughly investigate or take action against the employees involved in the theft and the cover-up. The worker, who actually took the money, was able to slip it into envelopes and walk right out of the bank with the cash unnoticed, passing several security checkpoints in the process. According to the Associated Press, one of the accused allegedly drew attention to the theft when they suddenly began spending as much as $6,000 per day on lottery tickets. Honest security workers at the bank noticed the large purchases and wondered how the person could afford to spend so much money even with a generous salary. For now, the historic heist remains under investigation as the details slowly come to light. 2. Chatham County Corruption In July of 2022, a corrections officer at the Chatham County Detention Center in Georgia filed a report claiming that the new guard they were training had admitted to being involved in drug smuggling in the past. According to records, 26-year-old Georgette Bennett told the training officer that she partook in smuggling at her previous job at a state prison in Reedsville, Georgia. She also allegedly said that she quit a past job after being suspected of smuggling contraband into a correctional facility for inmates, and that she had a history of being in and out of jail in New York State. Jail officials launched an investigation in response to the employee's complaint, but reportedly found no evidence to substantiate the claims against Bennett, who remained employed at the facility. Another investigation was launched five months later, after Bennett was accused of sneaking drugs into the jail. She was placed on probation from her job while the probe was carried out. This time, the evidence showed that Bennett had smuggled drugs into the facility in a styrofoam cup filled with ice. So, in February 2023, Bennett was fired from her job and was charged with possession with intent to distribute 
possession of a firearm or knife while committing or attempting to commit a felony, drug trafficking, violation of an oath by a public officer, and giving a prohibited item to an inmate. When questioned about why Bennett wasn't let go after the first batch of allegations surfaced, Chief Deputy Gary Taylor told Savannah Now that jail officials can't go on a witch hunt or fire someone based merely on speculation or suspicion. But the second investigation had turned up solid evidence to justify letting her go and criminally charging her. Montez Wade, the suspect accused of supplying the drugs to Bennett, was charged with drug trafficking. Both he and Bennett were held without bond while awaiting the next steps in their cases. Just weeks later, nurse practitioner Quen Nguyen was accused of stealing prescription medication from a former inmate. The meds were reportedly found inside the healthcare worker's car after a police canine showed an interest in the vehicle during an early morning search of the employee parking lot. Nguyen was charged with theft by taking, theft of government property, and theft of medical products. In May 2023, three months after the arrest of Bennett and Nguyen, another employee was accused of smuggling drugs into the Chatham County Jail. While working as a contract employee for the company that manages the jail's commissary, Michaela Worlds was allegedly paid $1,500 to sneak drug-soaked sheets of paper into the facility. She was charged with conspiracy to commit a felony and possession by delivery to an inmate. Worlds allegedly admitted to smuggling the drugs and was held without bond pending the outcome of her case. But, unfortunately, the current statuses of the accused former employees' cases are unclear. And now for number one. But if you want to hear even more stories, stay tuned for some extra content that you might have missed. 1. Amy Elizabeth Curry Over a five-month period starting in December 2022, an employee allegedly embezzled more than a million and a half dollars from an assisted living facility and nursing home in Waynesville, North Carolina. According to investigators, 46-year-old Amy Elizabeth Curry began working as the office manager and bookkeeper at Silver Bluffs in July of 2022. She started stealing money five months later. And between then and April 2023, she allegedly made 154 money transfers from her employer's bank account into five different personal accounts belonging to Curry and her then-boyfriend. Curry is accused of spending $51,000 of the stolen money on a Ford F-150 pickup trunk that she paid for outright. Federal investigators seized the trunk along with two sedans, an all-terrain vehicle, and four bank accounts containing nearly $118,000 between them. In April 2023, an administrator of the nursing facility received a notification from Chime Bank about suspicious activity being carried out by Curry. The administrator learned the extent of the fraud during a phone call with fraud investigators from Chime and another bank. Curry had allegedly gone as far as creating an account with Silver Bluff as the name in an attempt to fool bank officials into thinking it was affiliated with her employer. Following the investigation, authorities charged Curry with wire fraud and money laundering. If convicted of the wire fraud charge alone, she could face up to 20 years in federal prison and a fine of up to $250,000, while the money laundering charge carries a maximum sentence of 10 years. She could also face a forfeiture judgment, which is an order allowing law enforcement to confiscate proceeds and tools of a crime. Number 9. A Barred Romance In 2020, while working as a guard at Berrin Prison in Wrexham County, Wales, Jennifer Gavin started an inappropriate relationship with a 23-year-old inmate named Alexander Coxon. Word eventually reached her bosses, who caught her secret lover trying to give a cell phone to another prisoner. On the phone, authorities found explicit photos of a woman, who they suspected but couldn't confirm at the time, was Gavin. They also discovered videos of the woman lip-syncing to multiple songs, which she initially denied sending to the smuggled phone. Gavin eventually admitted that it was her in the nude photographs, but she denied receiving payments in exchange for bringing the phone into the facility. An investigation revealed that Coxon's sister transferred payments to Gavin's personal bank account, which she would have had no other legitimate reason for doing. Besides sending the photos, the disgraced corrections officer admitted to having a relationship with Coxon. 
She said it all started when she kissed him in the prison's kitchen during his cleaning duty. Naturally, Gavin's conduct got her in trouble with her job and the law itself. Her defense attorney claimed she was simply an empathetic, immature, and naive person who struggled with low self-esteem. They said she felt especially bad for prisoners during the COVID-19 lockdown. At the same time, the lawyer claimed Gavin took full responsibility for her actions and shared character references that her former co-workers provided despite her distasteful conduct. The judge overseeing this case said that he carefully considered any and all factors, but that it's also important to set the example that behavior like Gavin's cannot be tolerated within the prison system. He credited the young woman for taking responsibility for her actions and turning her life around, but ultimately ruled that only a custodial sentence is applicable. Even though she had a baby seven-month-old son at the time, Gavin received an eight-month jail term on top of being fired from her job. Coxon was also disciplined for being caught with the cell phone and was sentenced to 10 additional months behind bars. Number 8. TikTok Gangsters Authorities believe that a 28-year-old Albanian gangster named Edison Kakuli illegally entered the United Kingdom at some point during 2019. Afterwards, he was convicted of participating in a brutal assault during a drug-related disagreement. In 2022, while serving time for the offense, Kakuli and his buddies got their hands on a cell phone and started posting videos of their prison antics on TikTok. In what's been described as a mockery of the UK's justice system, some of the footage showed Kakuli making a gun symbol with his hands and smoking a cigarette while dancing to rap music in his cell with his prison friends. Comments on some of their videos helped confirm that Kakuli was one of the many men shown in the footage. After catching wind of the illicit videos, the Daily Mail contacted Britain's Ministry of Justice and the clips were quickly removed. By then, the posts had gained over 13,000 views, proving how necessary it is for the UK to crack down on illegal phones making their way into the country's prisons. The incident also came right after another scandal involving a 46-year-old convicted murderer and one of Britain's most notorious prisoners, David Norris, who was caught with a cell phone only a few months earlier. Authorities made the discovery after the Daily Mail informed them that Norris had sent selfies and WhatsApp messages to his friends on the outside from within prison walls. Staff members found the phone in an intimate part of Norris's body after getting the helpful tip. He was then moved to a higher security prison with zero chances of being relocated to a lighter security facility in the near future. Number 7. Federal Prisoner Seeks Deadly Revenge 51-year-old Richard Gilbert was extremely unhappy with the 10-year prison sentence he received for trafficking meth. During his time behind bars, he had a lot of time to think, so he came up with the idea of hiring a hitman to kill the South Carolina-based U.S. attorney who worked on his case. Using an illegal cell phone, Gilbert made several calls to arrange the hit and even sent $2,000 from his prison account to pay for the job. Little did he know, he was actually talking to an undercover FBI agent who was posing as a hitman. According to the Department of Justice, Gilbert tried to mislead authorities by claiming the $2,000 payment was for an investment firm. Prosecutors accused him of drawing maps and providing directions to the undercover agent on how to avoid surveillance cameras at the agreed-upon murder site. Gilbert was charged with murder for hire in 2020 and pleaded guilty in 2021 with the expectation of serving 22 years in addition to the decade-long sentence he was already doing time for. Simply put, he'll be well into his 70s by the time he's free again. Number 6. Inmate Tries to Kill In-Laws in late 2022, a couple in their 60s were discovered bleeding profusely from multiple stab wounds inside their Will County, Illinois home. They were immediately rushed to the hospital for treatment, along with an injured man who was later identified as their son-in-law, 36-year-old Michael Liu. Investigators figured out that Liu shot and stabbed the parents of his soon-to-be ex-wife a few days before he was going to turn himself in to Wisconsin police for a domestic battery conviction and violating an order of protection. The victim supposedly fought back fiercely and survived, leaving Liu seriously injured with 17 stab wounds himself. 
According to prosecutors, Liu carried out the attack on his in-laws for revenge against his estranged wife and her loved ones. He was charged with two counts of attempted murder, aggravated discharge of a firearm, aggravated domestic battery, home invasion, and more. While in jail, Liu allegedly tried to hire a hitman to finish what he couldn't. Authorities claimed that he approached other inmates to find a willing party and offered to pay $20,000 to have his in-laws killed. With help from a jailhouse snitch, law enforcement managed to obtain recordings of Liu agreeing to put a $10,000 down payment and an additional $10,000 upon the completion of the hit. In addition to the attempted murder charges, he now faces more charges for trying to hire a hitman. $1 million was also tacked onto his bond. He remains behind bars to this day. If convicted of the murder for hire charge, Liu could spend decades of his life in prison. Number 5. Career Criminal Con's Fellow Inmates Like many crooks and cons before him, Michael Moller saw the American government's COVID-inspired paycheck protection program as an opportunity to get easy money under what seemed like minimal oversight by police. But he was mistaken. By the time he was arrested, he'd siphoned an estimated $4.7 million from the program. The 42-year-old was later convicted of federal fraud charges and was awaiting sentencing at a Rhode Island jail when he decided to go through with one last con. Moller convinced two other inmates that he was a lawyer and could help them with their cases. More specifically, he promised to assist them with their criminal and immigration cases and to get them out of jail. For a steep price, of course. He persuaded them to give his girlfriend $17,000 before they tipped off the feds and an investigation was launched. The FBI then listened in on Moller's phone calls and quickly built a case against him. One victim paid $5,000 and the other forked over $12,000. Instead of using the cash to bail the men out of jail, Moller's girlfriend decided to blow the money on gambling, weed, and Moller's commissary. Moller went so far as to tell one of his victims to pack his things because he was about to get released. Not surprisingly, that never really happened. Instead of facing another trial and even more charges, Moller agreed to let the court consider his jail fraud in deciding his sentence for the original case. Prosecutors said that he is simply incapable of stopping himself from defrauding others. Further stating that during a period in time, which one would imagine Moller would be on his best behavior to convince the court he regretted his prior conduct, he did the exact opposite by orchestrating another scheme to defraud people. Moller's lawyer, on the other hand, claimed his client took full responsibility for his actions and was remorseful. The judge overseeing the case decided to sentence Moller to seven years in prison. This wasn't his first rodeo, though. Long before the paycheck protection scam, Moller was sentenced to six months of monitored house arrest for a federal tax fraud case. During that time, he committed four bank robberies, which he had to serve nine years in prison for. If that wasn't enough to stop him from committing future crimes, it's hard to believe that another seven years in the system will. But we'll have to wait and see. Number 4. Florida Woman Tries to Off Family while awaiting the results of her case for threatening to kill her former co-workers, 29-year-old ex-Disney employee Turegawa Inaru was locked up at Florida's Osceola County Jail. In early 2023, she was still behind bars when she apparently tried recruiting two cellmates to kill her parents and grandparents so she could collect a $2 million inheritance payout. According to authorities, Inaru offered a $50,000 payment per victim and claimed the intended victims had abused her and her siblings while they were children. Like many other murders for hire within prison walls, inmates ratted on her. In addition to accusing Inaru of trying to kill four of her family members, prosecutors claim she used social media to stalk the assistant state attorney, prosecuting her cases. Inaru said that she would gladly kill the attorney herself if she couldn't find someone else to do it for her, and that she wanted him to suffer and didn't really care if his family died in the process. An undercover detective entered the jail posing as an inmate and got evidence that Inaru disliked the assistant state attorney and believed in conspiracy theories. They failed to get the woman to say she wanted him dead, though. During questioning, Inaru allegedly confessed to trying to hire someone to kill her family. As a result, she now faces three counts of solicitation of murder as well as cyber-stalking. She's currently being held without bond 
while her case proceeds in court. Number 3. Delaware Prison Standoff In 2017, on what started out as a normal morning at the James T. Vaughan Correctional Center in Delaware, a group of inmates took four corrections officer and a number of other prisoners hostage. Officials later said that the hostage takers were wielding sharp objects, although they declined to elaborate on the nature of their weapons. Throughout the day, dozens of inmates left the building where the standoff was going down, and two of the four corrections officers who were held hostage were released. Three maintenance workers who initially tried hiding in the basement eventually managed to sneak onto the building's roof, where they were rescued. As the day went on, prisons across Delaware were put under lockdown, just in case anyone got inspired. Unlike many, if not most, prison riots, this one wasn't meant to make a simple statement about the conditions or treatment at that facility. According to a message the hostage takers delivered to the Wilmington-based news journal, it was meant to be a bigger political statement to convey their concerns about changes that could happen within the American prison system under the Trump administration. In a series of phone calls to news outlets and negotiations with authorities, the hostage-taker inmates said that they were confident things would soon change for the worse. In exchange for the hostages' release, they demanded a program that was rehabilitative for all inmates, as well as a thorough look into the prison's budget and spending habits. In the meantime, police became increasingly worried about 47-year-old corrections officer Sergeant Stephen Floyd after hearing no word on his condition, so they made a plan to storm the building. Using a backhoe, they knocked down a wall made out of footlockers the inmates had built to block the prison's entrance. Twenty hours after the standoff first started, law enforcement officers finally retook control of the prison. Sadly, Floyd was found unresponsive and was eventually declared dead at the scene. According to employees, he died while saving the lives of his co-workers. One female corrections officer made it out unharmed, thanks partially to some inmates who protected her from the hostage takers. None of the 120 inmates who were still in the building suffered any injuries during the standoff or when police later stormed the building. Sixteen prisoners were ultimately charged with first-degree murder, assault, kidnapping and riot in connection to the incident. Several were acquitted of their charges. The alleged mastermind of the plot, Duane States, was convicted of murder and received two life terms on top of the life sentence he was already serving for a separate murder. His co-defendant, Jaru Ayers, was acquitted of Floyd's death but was convicted on other charges related to the incident, landing him a 123-year sentence on top of the life sentence he was serving. Royal Downs, who played a crucial role in negotiating with authorities during the standoff and eventually began cooperating, testified as the prosecution's star witness. He received a three-year sentence for rioting, which will run consecutively to the life sentence he was already serving in connection to a separate case. Number 2. Hiring a Hitman from the Inside in 2011, when an Iowa man named Jason Harriman went to federal prison for possession of a firearm as a felon, he already had two previous stints under his belt for kidnapping and assaulting his ex-wife. During his third visit to the penitentiary, he told at least two fellow inmates that he wanted to find someone to help him kill his ex, who was only named in court documents as D.H. One of the prisoners Harriman confided in, William Reisinger, decided to tell law enforcement about the plans and in 2017, an investigation was officially launched. According to Reisinger, Harriman blamed D.H. for his imprisonment and frequently yelled at her over phone calls. After hanging up, Harriman vented to Reisinger about his frustrations and voiced his desires to disfigure the woman, making her unattractive and incapable of physical intimacy by paralyzing her. At some point, his revenge fantasy apparently escalated to murder. When Reisinger asked Harriman if he really wanted D.H. dead, he said yes and asked Reisinger if he knew anyone who would be willing to do the job. Reisinger said he would have to make a few calls. Little did Harriman know, the call was actually to Reisinger's son, with a request to contact law enforcement and rat out his friend on the inside. Harriman was provided with the contact information of William Johnson, an undercover agent who posed as a hitman. They spoke on several occasions on the phone and through email, which led to a two-hour-long meeting during which they planned a written contract for the murder of D.H. and her boyfriend. 
The men initially spoke through code, referring to the victims as Property 1 and Property 2, and talking about demolishing the properties. It was pretty obvious what Harriman meant, but authorities needed more specific terminology in order to feel like they had secured enough evidence to pin him with a murder for hire charge. During their final meeting, Johnson got Harriman to clarify in explicit terms that he wanted both victims dead. He also gave Harriman multiple opportunities to walk away from the deal, but Harriman remained committed to seeing their agreement through to completion. He even said that he wanted DH to know he was behind what was going to happen to her. And while Harriman got suspicious over Johnson's need to confirm the details out loud and sign a written contract, he could have backed out, and he didn't. As a down payment for the double hit, he agreed to give Johnson his 1969 Dodge Charger. He also promised to pay $21,000 for DH and her boyfriend to be killed if they were together, or $41,000 if they were killed separately. In a sadistic twist, Harriman asked Johnson to record the murders on video so that once he was out of prison, he could see the crime himself. A federal jury later convicted Harriman on two counts of murder for hire, and he was sentenced to an additional 20 years in prison, which will run consecutively to the 15 years he is already serving. This means that he probably won't be released until sometime during the 2040s, at which point he'll be in his 70s. Number 1. Cheating Wife Conspires with Imprisoned Boyfriend Donna Roberts met her third husband, Robert Fingerhut, in 1980. A few years later, they decided to settle down in Youngstown, Ohio, where they ran a car rental business and operated two Greyhound bus stations. They made a comfortable living for themselves that provided Donna with pretty much anything she wanted, but she was unsatisfied with other aspects of her marriage and soon started an affair with a much younger man named Nathaniel E. Jackson. When Jackson went to prison two years into their affair, he and Donna stayed in touch over the phone and through written letters. During their conversations, they fantasized about being together and living like a real couple, something that could only happen if Robert Fingerhut was taken out of the picture. So it's not surprising that Fingerhut was shot to death in his home almost immediately after Jackson got out of prison in 2001. At the time, authorities were blissfully unaware of the romantic connection between Donna and Jackson. Shortly after her husband's death, Donna called 911 and played the role of a shocked and devastated widow. But it wasn't long before investigators found out about her affair with the newly released prisoner. And when they listened to phone calls between the couple while Jackson was still imprisoned, it became clear that the two had planned to kill Fingerhut. Detectives also found dozens of incriminating letters that Jackson and Roberts had written back and forth, which backed up their suspicions. While the actual murder didn't happen until Jackson was released, the evidence proved that he had agreed to commit the crime while he was still behind bars, which is illegal in and of itself. In addition to wanting Fingerhut dead so that they could carry on with their messed up relationship, authorities found reason to believe that Roberts and Jackson planned to collect the victim's life insurance policy to fund their new life. During questioning, Jackson admitted to killing Fingerhut, but denied that Donna had any knowledge of the plot. He also claimed that he shot the victim out of self-defense. But DNA evidence found in Fingerhut's car tied both suspects to the scene, and the content of their messages strongly indicated that they were both involved in Fingerhut's murder. Jackson maintained all throughout his trial that Roberts had nothing to do with the crime. He was sentenced to death for the crime. Donna Roberts was also convicted and sentenced to death. She is the only woman in the state of Ohio who is currently on death row. At 78 years old, she may not live to see her execution date, but she'll eventually die in prison either way. All because she decided that killing her husband was better than leaving him. What's the most corrupt or questionable thing you've ever seen one of your bosses or supervisors do? And how did you react to it? Did you report the suspicious activity even if it meant possibly risking your job? Or did you keep your mouth shut and act like you knew nothing? And if you could go back in time, would you handle the situation differently? Let us know in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.